At this time, of, at this time of the year, we when we think of miracles, we think, of course, of baby Jesus and, and the Christmas miracle. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's what it's all about. But today I want to give you a little different idea about miracles. Um, and there's one particular in the Old Testament I think that qualifies. Um, also, we associate miracles with healings. And that's right too. That's right too when we say it's a miracle that, that I was healed. And so I have some stories I want to tell you. Uh, some examples I want to share with you because I know for a fact everybody in here needs a miracle. I need a miracle. I'm telling you, we all do. And sometimes it's right in front of us. It's right in front of our eyes. And, and we just don't know it. So I hope what God gave me so I could see mine will help you see yours. I always... Um, this always gets to me. I, I look up the definition of miracle. And this is what Webster says that a miracle is. A surprising and welcome event, okay, I'll give them that, that is not explainable by natural or scientific laws. Okay, that makes sense. I'll give them that. And therefore, is considered to be the work of a divine agency. There's where I disagree. I got news for you, Webster. Your divine agency is God. He is the only one that does miracles. So let's get that right first and foremost. Okay, a divine agency. But that's okay. We'll, we'll let them have that. It cracks me up. It's funny uh, how they won't use the word God. Okay? And also, they won't even concede that we lost a day in history somewhere. We lost a whole day. We all know how because Joshua told the sun to stand still. Well, they won't acknowledge that. But that's okay because they'll acknowledge him one day, the ones that don't believe. So we'll just, we'll just pray for that. And I want to bring you a couple of points, two or three points, about miracles and, I th and why we miss them. And the first one I want, to, I want to talk about is our choice. Our choices in life. I wear a bracelet every day. And this bracelet says... You are only one choice away from a different life. And I'm going to tell you where this bracelet come from. I'm going to tell you how I come about getting it. There's a, there's a young man. Teenagers, I want you to listen to me right now. There is a young man in a hospital bed that's paralyzed from the waist, or I'm sorry, from the neck down. Okay, he can't move. Good looking, good looking young fella. And... On his prom night, he decided for the first time, choice, that he was going to drink. And he got drunk, and he got in a wreck, and he's paralyzed from the neck down. Up above his hospital bed is a picture of him in his tux. Good look, and he wants you to look at it. He wants you to see it. But he also wants you to know that you're one choice away from a different life. One choice is all it takes. Now, life is full of choices. Don't ever forget that. And I'm here to tell you that I was a part of that. Um, five of my friends in my inner circle in high school, okay, one of them got killed my senior year. The other one died in 2002 of an overdose. And the other three or four to this day doesn't know the Lord, doesn't they still doing things they shouldn't be doing. Okay, now watch. I love them. If they called me at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, Eddie, I need you, guess where I would be? I would be there. But I just can't hang around them no more. I just can't. See, but they know I love them. And you know what? They're on their way. It's just a matter of God's timing. But choice, choice. You are one choice away from having a different life. And you know that will preach by itself. You can insert so many things in that that you're one choice away. The most important choice that you're going to make every single day is your attitude. It's what you wake up with. Now, I want you to write this down if you take notes. I come across this. I didn't make it up. I wish I could take credit for it, but I didn't. That's okay. This is what we do. We share. Iron sharpens iron. Your internal attitudes are far more important than your external circumstances. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again for you. 
your attitude and choices, okay? Your internal attitudes are far more important than your external circumstances. Now, I don't know if y'all noticed this or not, but I'm short. Did that take y'all by surprise? A, li a little, ha, huh? that was good. Okay, now, I'm going to, listen, guys, I've got to be me. And I have to throw humor in everything I do because I want to be an encourager. I want to laugh. I don't want to cry. I don't want to worry. I want to be glad, okay? So I've got to be me. As much as I like blonde highlights, I've got to be me, all right? I'll, I'll let y'all figure out who that was. Y'all know him? Okay. For the record, I am five foot six and three quarters. Now, I round that off to five foot seven. Okay? Just, I've rounded off to five foot seven. My waist, or my length of my pants, is actually a 28 or 29, but I wear a 30 because everybody will see the tag on the back. And I want to be just a little bit taller. Okay? Now, I can make a choice to get mad about that, and if I did, I would be mad all the time. And I'm going to give you some examples of why, because I hear it all the time. Somebody texted me this week, hey, man, are you baptizing? I said, no, no, it ain't me. He said, okay, just want to make sure I get the floaties out or not. Okay. <laughs> all right, hey, I, 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 that, that's fine. Well, it don't stop there, you know. Um, our pastor's doing a devotional with me this morning, and he says, don't worry, Eddie, I'll make it short, and then starts laughing. Now, it even carries over to the kids. I was crossing the parking lot the other day. They was on the playground. One of them yelled out, and I was getting in my car. They said, hey, Eddie, can you reach the pedals? I said, yeah, if I move the seat all the way up. So your attitude, your attitude is going to determine, okay? Your, it's your choices and how you act. And I'm going to be happy, and I'm going to laugh, and I'm going to cut. I really ain't got no choice. My gosh, I'd run around mad all the time. Because that's not it. That's just the little examples, okay? Your attitude and your choices can be a blessing blocker, and it can also be a, a miracle blocker. And that includes worry. Worry. Worry is focused thinking on something negative. Meditation is doing the same thing, only focusing on God's Word instead of your problem. Right? You want me to repeat that one? That's a good one, too. Worry is focused thinking on something negative. What are you focusing on? You know? Meditation is doing the same thing, only focusing on God's Word instead of your problem. That means reading your Bible. Y'all figured that out. How you feel is what you're focusing on. That's how, how you feel is what you're focusing on. Focus on Jesus. He has a miracle for you. He has a miracle for me. He has a miracle for everybody. But we got to look. We got to find. We got to understand what a miracle is because a lot of times it's right there and we just don't know. Isaiah 59. I, you, I love this scripture. I'm telling you because it tells it all. Isaiah 59 verses 1 through uh, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Surely his ear is not too dull to hear. It's our iniquities that separates us from God. You have to put in what your iniquity is because that's what separates you. A hard prayer to pray would be, God, whatever's keeping me away from you, whatever's in between there, take it away because we really might not want that. But, but you have to plug in. I have to plug in whatever our iniquities are. I really think the reason our grandparents blaze the trail for us is because they didn't have the distractions we have. I'll tell you right now, I watch way too much TV. And I have seriously contemplated taking my TV out of my house, try it for a week. I wonder how much more I would know about this if I'd done that. My grandmother never had a TV. She never had a driver's license. She didn't even have an indoor bathroom until 1980, and she died in 93. It was the happiest woman I ever met in my life. It makes no sense to me, but I want to be there. I want to be there. All right, sometimes it's the little dumb things that keep you from seeing your miracle because of your attitude, because of the way we think and do. Now, <clears throat> I made a promise to my wife in the first service 
that I wouldn't tell this story anymore. I want to correct myself. I meant today, okay? A lot of you has heard this story, but, I, but I've got to tell it again because it's such a good example, and I get to pick on my wife all at the same time, okay? But it'll give you an idea of how you can handle a situation that might escalate into something over something stupid, like taking dogs out one Sunday morning. You going to take the dogs out? I said, nope. She said, well, I ain't either. I, I took them out last time, so here we go with that. Oh, I've done it last time. You've done it last time. Y'all ain't never done it. you a bunch of religious people. You do too. Now, I said, all right, I'll take them out. And I was mad. I mean, I was. I said, I'll take them out. You better believe it. And I hook them dogs up, and I pick them up, and their feet's off the ground, and they're kicking. They're wondering what's going on. So I take them out to the bathroom. And so the first thing I'm thinking of is how am I going to get her back? That's, I know y'all don't, right? How am I going to get her back? So I figured it out really quick because I went into my bathroom. I have a bathroom, a, a half bath that I would get ready in, okay? It was, it's all mine, okay? Now, but it's not a man bathroom. It's a pretty bathroom. It's a pretty bathroom. It can't have Pittsburgh Steeler wallpaper or, or something cool like a man, you know? It's, it's got to be pretty. It's got to be decorative. And I've got a towel on the left-hand side that I'm not even allowed to use. <laughs> What's it there for? Because it's pretty. All right. So anyway, I get, I get to brushing my teeth real good, and I get to spitting, and I look over there and I seen it. Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. Later on that morning, we're in Sunday school, and we was doing something about I don't even remember confession. It was something about confession. Do you remember? And we were supposed to confess. You know, of course you don't. And uh, so, hey, listen, I admitted it. I stood up and I said, Michelle, I got a confession to make. I said, I I've got to tell you. I said, I wiped my mouth on that towel this morning and I liked it. <laughs> now, now, that's the last time. I got another one, but that's for another time. But, but do you see what I'm saying? I mean, my gosh. Do you see how that could escalate it in something silly and we come to church mad? You ever come to church mad? If you got kids, you've come to church <laughs> mad. You have. Don't sit there and tell me that. And the, um, So miracles, miracles. Did you know that the first miracle ever in the Bible come out of John chapter 2? Okay, John chapter 2. Now, we all know the story. Um, Jesus turned water into wine. And, and what aggravates me about this, instead of focusing on what he actually did and why he did it, everybody wants to argue about whether or not the wine had alcohol in it or not. Well, I, I wasn't there. I suspect that it didn't because, you know, you had wine and you had water and you may have had goat's milk, maybe camel's milk. I don't know. You didn't have no skier of that Mountain Dew. So... They didn't have much to drink anyway, but we want to focus, instead of being that his first miracle that he did, and you check me out, that's his first miracle, we want to argue about that. Okay, here's what I got to say about that. Who cares? If it was, he, he didn't do it for everybody to drink and get drunk. That's not what his intention was, right? That's not what he wanted you to do with it. But, but, you, but you get people that wants the Bible to read the way they want it to read. And they say, well, the Bible says wine's good, a little little wine. Yeah, you're right, little, you know, is good for the soul or good for the body. Well, who do you think made marijuana? God? I don't think he meant for you to smoke it, right? Choices, attitude. Starting to understand? We want to argue about this little petty stuff about his first miracle, you know? And all, and, and really... All he was doing was minding what his mama said. You agree? I mean, he was just doing what his mother said to do. Um, one of the earliest miracles in the Bible, and I found this, and I love it, and I want to share it with you today. Oh, I got one more for you. I almost forgot about the beer thing. Well, I wish I had a pair of suspenders on. I got the belly and say, well, the doctor told me I could drink a beer a day and it helped my kidneys. Well, guess what? Water will do the same thing. God don't care if you drink water, okay? 
That was for somebody. I don't know who. All right. Okay. Miracles. I want to tell you about this early miracle. It's in Numbers. Chapter 11, verse 31 and 32. Numbers, chapter 11, 31 and 32. Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp and about two cubics above the surface, surface of the ground. And the people stayed up all, all that day and night and all the next day and gathered the quail. They gathered at least 10 homers for themselves and spread it around. I want to do a little preface to that. The Israelites were running around, and they wanted meat. They decided they wanted some meat. They was tired of eating um, melons and fruits, I guess, and they was tired of getting drunk on wine, so they wanted some meat. I didn't, did I say drunk on wine? Anyway, they wanted meat. Well, let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you what God did when he answered their prayer about this meat. Based on the Hebrew system of measurement. Okay, now somebody come up with this, not me. Because I, I didn't do good in math. But listen to this. This is so good. This shows you how big God is. Based on the Hebrew system of measurement, a day's walk was approximately 15 miles in any direction. So if you square the radius and multiply by pi, we're talking about an area almost 700 square miles miles to put that into perspective Washington DC is only 68.3 not only was this an area 10 times larger than the nation's capital but the quail were piled 3 feet deep that, I don't think that, that's probably about 4 I don't know can you imagine that area that much quail because when God does it he does it right but it ain't over. This, this right here, this, this takes the cake. Once the quail stopped falling, the Israelites started gathering. Each Israelite gathered no less than 10. 10 of those multiplied by 600,000 men equals 6 million homers at a minimum. A homer equated to roughly 200 liters, and assuming the quail were average size, it rained somewhere in the neighborhood of 105 million quail because, again, when God does it, God does it big. He don't halfway do it, just like Adam and Eve in the beginning, right? He replaced, he replaced them with a permanent skin to cover their bodies, even after they had sinned, even after they, the Israelites were fussing, because God, that's what he does for us. Now, I think if we wanted to compare that to today, you're like, well, how, how about today? Okay, how about? You go grab somebody from the other side of the world and you bring them here and you go to Fiesta, Mexico and give them clean water and something to eat. That is the same thing. That is a miracle to them. We have no idea. They ain't even got clean water. But that's what that compares to. And you probably don't even have to go across the country. You could probably do it a little closer to home. But again, that's what God does. He does it, and he does it big. I never will forget uh, Dr. Uh, Dwayne Fraser. He adopted some children um, out of Africa. And I'm talking deep into Africa, too, like a, a dirt floor and cutting through. If, you, if you've ever heard his story, cutting through the jungle, it's, 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 it's remarkable. remarkable. But here's what's sad. When he got those kids home, he had to keep his eye on them out in the yard because they were trying to bend down and pick up bugs and eat them. Now that'll make you think. Had to teach them, no, 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 no. You've got something to eat now. You don't have to do that. Pick up bugs off the ground and eat them. See, that, that was their miracle. That was their miracle to get to come to him to have something to eat. Sometimes, um, sometimes what we think is a, is a disaster or a tragedy is really a miracle uh, for someone else. And I, I know we often relate it to healing, but, you know, God tells us that he reigns on the just and he reigns on the unjust. And he tells us that when times are good to be glad in them and enjoy them, 
But remember, when times are bad, he's the maker of them both. But, that, but that's hard to swallow for some of us. And if, if there is ever a time and ever a place that we need a miracle, it's in this country right now for our president. And I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, y'all know, because listen to me. Y'all know a Republican's not going to fix it, a Democrat's not going to fix it, a government's not going to fix it. God is the only one that's going to fix this country because he told us if we would humble ourselves, he would, he would heal our land. But see, it takes, listen, watch, it's up to us. This, this little crowd compared to the rest of the world, God hears your prayers. He hears your prayers. So it's up to us to keep praying. Don't ever give up. Pray, 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 pray. Because just when you think it's not going to happen, it's going to happen. But we just have to keep telling ourselves, God's mind is not our, our mind. His timing is not our timing. I wish he could tell you what it was, but I, I, I can't. But he, he'll, bring, he'll bring the best out of you in the worst circumstances. I, I'm just going to tell you all the truth. This has been a hard week this week. And you want to know why? Because he know I was supposed to have been right here. And we battled sickness. We, we've, we've battled this week. So praise God that he didn't win. Praise God that the devil didn't win, okay? Um, for, these, for these last examples that I want to give you, I want the praise team to, to come on up. I want a little music in the background. You remember that, that I told you that Sometimes tragedy brings miracles in other people's life. And, you know, I don't understand it all. Storms come, hurricanes come, tornadoes come. It, it, it jumps over one house and gets the other. I don't know about all that. But I know that God works in mysterious ways because he tells us to. I had a, and this is real, so you can bank on these next these next three examples, you can bank on them because, see, I've, I've lived them. I've been a part of them. And it was, about, it was about this time last year that I had a cousin that was, uh, she's 50, I think she's 57, 58. Her husband was a Baptist preacher down in Greene County, and he died. He died kind of unexpectedly. He, was, he had been sick, but he died. And um, she was also not in very good health. And the doctors, she had a bad heart, and the doctors had told her, they said, um, you're not going to live unless you have a heart transplant. You have to have a heart transplant, and you're probably going to have to have it pretty quick. So I think it was a Thursday that they told her this, and I want you to know, and there's more to the story, even though this is exciting, she was on the operating table that Saturday receiving her new heart. Okay? So God answered her prayer. But see, it gets better. It gets better. Listen to this. That Saturday was Christmas Eve. That Saturday was her birthday. That Saturday was her anniversary where her husband had just died. You think God don't get it right? You think he don't know what he's doing? And there is no doubt in my mind that Timmy went before God and Jesus too and said, help her, and gave her a touch. And to this day, to this day, I'm telling you, she's healthy as she can be. Praise God. Praise God. See, that, that's the kind of... That, that's the kind of miracles that, that we like that we want to hear. We need them because somebody needed that. Somebody out there needed that because there is hope for you. Your miracle is coming. Don't give up on your miracle. You know, if God has got to be in it, who else would you want in it? If the only way it's going to be fixed is for God to do it, I wouldn't want it any other way because I don't have it figured out. When I was born, I got two more because I know somebody needs to hear these. When I was born, I was really, really sick. I had asthma, really, really bad. 
1967, the only thing they can give is penicillin. So I had done took all the penicillin I could take. I spent my first Christmas in the hospital. I spent my first Easter. It was really bad. Double pneumonia. I mean, I just really weak. And the doctor told my mom, he, he's not going to live. He, he's just not. He can't take any more penicillin. There's nothing else. There is nothing else we could do for him. Now, see, my mother knows the Lord. My mother got saved at, at, at a young age in her backyard. So she's been the best example. She's been my rock in my life. But at that time, they, the iniquities, the iniquities was there. So my mother done the only thing she knew to do, and she took me to church. And she went up in front of that church. I actually think it was a tent revival, and they rubbed oil on my head. That's why I'm here today. She went back to the doctor. The doctor said, I don't know what happened. Mama said, I do. You're divine agency. That's what happened, Mr. Webster. That's all I can tell you. So praise God. Because see, he's got more miracles for me. He's got more for me to do. He's got something for every one of us to do. And it's coming. I got good news for you. It's coming. This, this is my last one. And this is my hardest. See, y'all got to hang with me. I, I sit there and I prayed to God this morning. I said, God, please don't let me get up here and cry. And he said, well, that's you. Okay, so. So my dad, at this time in my life, was an alcoholic. They never would tell me that for a long time in my life. They, they just wanted to hide it from me. And I mean a bad alcoholic. He wasn't mean. He wasn't nothing like that. But I'm talking about vodka and pickled dog for breakfast. You know, that's that pretty much qualifies, right? And this is what my mother told my dad. She said, "We're gonna turn this thing around. After after God has saved our son, we're going down here to this church, St. Mark United Methodist Church." And my dad, okay, this is where I disagree with the medical profession that says alcoholism is a disease because my dad had a disease. He had what you call Parkinson's. And he couldn't make a choice to set that down. But you know after mama told him that, that bottle got set down and he never picked it back up again. I don't worry about my dad anymore. My dad's in heaven. So today... So today, during this altar call, I know that you're looking for a miracle. You're looking for that divine agency, as Mr. Webster calls it. They can call it what they want. It's God. You're looking for one. I know I'm looking for one. Don't give up. Don't give up and, and keep praying. Um, about a year ago, my, my youngest son was here for the first service, and he had to leave, but See, about a year ago, he got hit by a truck, for Pete's sakes, y'all. He was loading propane tanks into a truck. A woman ran up on a sidewalk and hit him. Propane tanks. you imagine how bad that, that would be? He was off almost a year. He never hit his head. God spared his life because he had a miracle for him. But he's also got something for him to do. And he'll figure that out. He'll figure that out. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of every single one of them. So... See, during this altar call, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what y'all are going through. I don't, but God does. But see, I need a miracle today. This was, this was for me too. It's, you know, we, hey, everybody goes through it. And I know God's got it because he tells us he will not put us through more than what we can handle. So I want you to join me. And, and most importantly, if you don't know Christ, if you've never been saved for the first time, if you've never asked Him to come into your heart, man, what a time during this Christmas season to be saved, to get it right. You know, so we've got, I'm up here, Brian's up here, Brett. we got people all around that will talk to you and help. Please come, don't put it off another second, because you know what? You have to be saved for God to hear your miracle. Because He... To hear your request for your miracle, He can't hear you unless you've been saved. That's true. 
That's true, he can't hear you because he hears the voice of his children. So I'm going right down here in this corner and I'm going to grab my family because we need some miracles. And I know you do too.